In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Christ is born. Glorify Him. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we were to ask what it is that we celebrate in this feast of Christmas. We would, of course, answer the incarnation, that God takes flesh. And of course, that's true. But how curious is it that in possibly the greatest exposition of our Lord's incarnation, written in the middle of the fourth century by Saint Athanasius the Great, who was Archbishop, Patriarch of Alexandria, though he spent more time in exile from that post than fulfilling it because of his very orthodox Christology, how curious is it that in that great work, Saint Athanasius does not at all treat the infancy narratives, doesn't mention it. In fact, he only mentions in passing a few times that our Lord is born from a virgin mother. In fact, he expresses it by saying the Lord fashions for himself a temple from a virgin womb. So what is it that we celebrate? For Saint Athanasius, the Incarnation isn't about Bethlehem. The Incarnation is about the cross. Saint Athanasius talks about the revelation of God in the flesh when he suffers that apparent degradation, he calls it, of the cross, that thing which was a stumbling block for Jews and a scandal and a, and a mockery for Greeks, for the pagans. It's on the cross that our Lord's incarnation is made manifest. This is the full revelation of God and man. It's on the cross that we come to understand the Incarnation. There is no understanding of what goes on in Bethlehem without the cross. And it's for this reason that Saint Athanasius emphasizes this. In fact, in Saint Athanasius' lifetime, the Feast of Christmas was not even celebrated. It comes to the Christian East some about a decade after his death. And in a great oration in Constantinople, just after he became the patriarch there, St. Gregory the theologian, gave us those famous words which we sing now in the hymns of this feast. Christ is born, glorify him. Christ comes from heaven, meet him. And that was when the feast of Christmas had first been celebrated in Constantinople at the end of the fourth century. And since then, we can argue pretty clearly from Christian history that what we've done is progressively defang and declaw this mystery of Christmas. So what we have today largely has been emptied of its power, emptied precisely of that celebration, that commemoration of the Incarnation to which Saint Athanasius directed us, and indeed Saint Gregory the theologian as well, upon receiving this new feast at the end of the fourth century. What has it become but simply this focus on a narrow part of the infancy narratives, the focus on the birth of a baby, the focus on a comfortable hearth, a place of joy, of peace, maybe picking up on the words of the angels to the shepherds, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. Isn't this marvelous, this sweet scene that is depicted for us? And now we have completely replaced anything of the Christian story with the jingle of bells and the spread of merriment and joy and festivity, visits to one another. Not that any of that is wrong, but it's a, it's a poor substitute. It's a weak counterfeit of where the real peace and joy and grace of this feast are located. And we can only recover that by focusing exactly on what St. Athanasius directed us to, 
which is to say, the cross. And interestingly, if we pay attention in both Matthew and Luke to the very infancy narratives themselves, we find that this is what they direct us to, not to some sort of simple human family joy on the birth of a child, and isn't this marvelous amidst all of the turmoil and chaos of the world, we can nevertheless draw close to one another and celebrate this birth of a child amidst all of that. Far from it. If we actually pay attention to what's going on in these Gospels, we will see that it's a reading back from the cross of the totality of what the cross represents, this clash of kingdoms, this clash of empires, that God who created the whole universe and made it good has now come to take up for once and for all the sovereign power on earth. Heaven has come to rule on earth and therefore all pretenders to ruling earth must pass away. This is the story told in Luke, for example, where he sets the story amidst the census of a great Caesar, of a great king and one who styled himself Lord and indeed Son of God. In the midst of this story, of this taking of a census for the taxation of the whole world, this child is born to replace the Caesar, to replace the emperor, to replace the empire and all that he represents. This is what's going on, and this is precisely what Mary sings about upon hearing the Annunciation, that those who hold the, the levers of power in this world are going to be taken away that those who style themselves as kings and rulers of the earth will need to cede their authority to heaven and the powers of heaven that come to take that up. That the rich will turn poor and the poor will be exalted, the hungry filled. This is what we should be singing in our Christmas carols. Or we think, for example, of Simeon, and his prophecy upon receiving the Christ child in the temple on his 40th day, about how this child would be for the rise and fall of many, and that a sword would pierce Mary's heart. The cross rushes backwards to meet the Christ child. And this, of course, is told too in the Gospel of Matthew, which we have been following in the last few services here. The story of the one who is coming to fulfill that which was promised through the prophet Isaiah, that God would come to be with us. And we heard on Friday night that great hymn from the prophecy of Isaiah, that God is with us and all the nations must submit, all the powers of this world must give way to this child who is God taking up the throne of earth and heaven. And what goes on in this story, but that the pretender to authority in Judea, Herod, is threatened. And he sends his troops and he sends his, all of his authorities to take note of what's going on. He feels threatened and so he, he seeks out the child. And so what happens? But Joseph, the foster father, is warned in a dream, as we heard in this morning's gospel, to take the child by night, fleeing as a refugee into Egypt, only to return on Herod's death, but even then having to go to Galilee, not to Judea, because Archelaus ruled in Herod's place. This clash of kingdoms is the very story that is told in the infancy narratives, not sweetness and light, this is all out war and clash between what God is bringing in his authority and everything on earth that stands in his way. And it's a violent and bloody struggle, the death of the infants, those innocents in the realm, in the, in the region of Bethlehem that are put to death because of this clash, whom we commemorate in our church calendar in a couple of days amongst the holy innocents of God. 
And we see this also reflected in all of the liturgy, the hymns of our of, of the feast, if we listen carefully to them. We see it also depicted in the icon of the feast of nativity. If we pay close attention, we'll see this is not what you normally see depicted in the stable manger scene, the creche that is put out in a lot of Christian churches and homes, that kind of sweet imagery that you get. This instead is Christ born in a cave, a cave that looks precisely like the tomb of Joseph, hewn from new rock that we read about after Christ's death on the cross. And what is Christ placed in but a manger, a place where animals feed, that is depicted in the icon like a sarcophagus. And Christ, who's wrapped in swaddling clothes, like he will be wrapped by Joseph and Nicodemus after he's taken down from the cross. The Christ child already bearing a halo with a cruciform shape depicting his crucifixion. And of course, receiving gifts of gold for a king, of frankincense for a god, but also of myrrh for his burial. There is no sweetness in this picture. This isn't saccharine. This should not be declawed and defanged, as I say. We need to receive this story in its fullness, but not for that without joy. The real joy here is that God has come to be king on earth, and for those who are born anew in him, they have the eyes to see it and to experience it and to live it here and now. That is what it means to be a Christian. No longer to seek to collude with Caesar or Herod, but rather to submit ourselves to the authority of heaven that has come to earth to rule. That is the comfort, the joy that we share. That is the ultimate peace that the angels sing of, the peace on earth that has come from heaven. And so we have a choice. You know, in the hymns the other night, and this is so often the case, there's one or two that will kind of stand out in one's mind. You can't listen to a four-hour vigil and pay attention to every word, at least I can. But this year, one particular stikaron stood out for me, the doxtastikon, on the praises at Matins, which talks precisely about that the time that this took place was during a census when Caesar sought to tax the whole world and to enumerate all the people. And it says that Christ himself was taking a census and is taking a census. And he's enumerating those who believe in his birth, who believe that he is the true king. And we offer to him not tribute money, the Sikharan says, but our orthodoxy, our orthodox faith, and practice, our commitment, our submission to his will, our obedience to his gospel, seeking to implement in our lives his kingdom. That is what we are called to do. If we call ourselves Christians, it's because we are under his kingship, under his sovereignty, and we know what that means in terms of our mission to the world. It means precisely to enact everything that he came to rule and will ultimately rule when he is all in all. It means to look after homeless refugees like he was. It means to confront the powers of this world in all the chaos and destruction and violence and evil that they foment and pr promote. It means to find ways to bring here and now the life of the age to come. That is what it means to celebrate Christmas. Because the sad reality of the Christmas as it has become that Christmas for old ladies and young children only, that Christmas of comfort around the hearth fire in our homes, in our families drawing near, that's come at a cost. The comfort, the joy, the cheer, the merriment that we experience there has come at too high a cost to all of those who are left out of that peace and joy, those whom the Lord has come to deliver and to rule over. And we must get away from this counterfeit 
version of the Feast of the Nativity and celebrate the fullness of the Incarnation as St. Athanasius directs us to, to the cross which triumphs over sin and death and darkness and Caesar and Herod. So let us cease worshiping those and worship and submit ourselves to the one who comes from heaven. Let us meet the Christ child. Christ is born. Lord. Lord.